I'll do a brief intro. I think most of you know David here. But he does, he does come from England. I uh, study design and art uh, from Maidstone College of Art. Uh, 12 years as a designer and two major international companies. Uh, he also founded a typesetting service and bureau, typesetting and service bureau business. Um, and he designs here at Humber as a professor for the Media Studies School. Thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> Um, actually, I'm just going to recap on some, some of what you said. I know you didn't come here to uh, hear my life story, but uh, some of it is very relevant. Okay? I actually uh, grew up in um, North East England in a place called Kingston upon Hull, which ironically is on the River Humber Estuary. Oh. And life pretty much revolved around the river. And it was. Uh, Hull actually was the third seaport after London and Liverpool. Uh, sadly, the place has gone into uh, something of a decline, and the fishing industry and dockland areas that were there when I was a kid have pretty much all gone. Um, and the place has had to kind of reinvent itself. Um, now, I left Hull when I was 19 years old to go to art school. And this was very much against the wishes of my parents and the advice of my uh, careers advisor in school. In fact, I remember going to a meeting with him, and in those days they, they didn't refer to you by your uh, um, given name, they re always referred to you by the surname and attached the word lad on to the end as a bit of a kind of put down. <laughs> so I remember him saying to me, Barkworth lad. What are we going to do with you? Because I must admit, I wasn't very good academically in high school. All of the reading, writing, and arithmetic stuff kind of left me a bit cold, and I spent most of my time in the art room. But thankfully, uh, with some encouragement from my art teacher, and a lady called Mrs. Birch, who um, attended an art, an evening class that I went to, uh, they encouraged me to rebel and go to art school. Now I must admit, when I went, I didn't even know what a graphic design was. Um, in fact, really the word designer um, as a job title didn't really fully exist at that time in terms of graphic design. What we were called were commercial artists. And basically what you did was you went to art school, learned how to paint and draw, and then sold your soul to the devil and became a commercial <laughs> artist, okay? <laughs> but anyway, when I got to that particular point, I decided I would um, go to graphic design school in Maidstone, and that's where I stayed for three years. Now, to cut a long story short, I um, always had the idea that I would have my own business. And in those days, design was very much an exclusive club that you got into by demonstrating that you could draw. Okay? Um, computers have changed all of that. Now, there are some ironies in all of this. Um, I'm considered here as something of a, a guru when it comes to the software, particularly the Adobe Suite and the InDesign. In fact, I have a plaque at home that some students gave me about uh, probably 12 years ago that engraved into it is Dr. Quark. <laughs> okay? Because at that time we were using the program Quark Express. Now, InDesign has replaced that here, but it's a very, very similar thing. And yet, to be honest, if, if from a pure work satisfaction point of view, if somebody said to me tomorrow that we'd realise that computers were a terrible thing and that they were going to be banned, I would be out in the streets doing my lotto happy dance. Okay? Because one of the issues, and it's central to what I want to talk about today, is that the, um, the value of what graphic designers do currently in today's money is about a quarter of what it was 25 years ago. And this is very worrying to me, 
especially from my students' point of view. I'm okay, I've had a, a career, I have a job I love, and I consider that I get well paid for that, okay? And I enjoy everything, I love it, okay? So I'm very fortunate that way. But I must admit, I wouldn't really like to be in the position some of my students will find themselves in um, in a few weeks' time, where they're looking for work and trying to sustain, as I've done, a 40-year career. It, very difficult. And other industries, creative industries, have suffered in very much the same way, including architecture, music, lots of things. Okay. Um, now, I think there are very good reasons for this um, that escape some people. Okay. Um, and the problem is, the people who are actually commissioning the work often have um, had myths embedded in their head. And they don't understand them because they've never ha actually done it. Their decisions are based on what they believe rather than what's actual fact. And the first thing is, and I, I once did this as an experiment in another talk very similar to this, I looked through Adobe's promotional material and, and a lot of the points that were made was, you would say this feature allows you to quickly and easily do things. And I was actually showing my students one this morning. It's, it's the graphing tool in Illustrator. If you read the website for Adobe's introduction to the graphing tool, it tells you this tool allows you to quickly and easily do this thing. But anybody who's done it realizes that it's not actually as easy as it looks. It can be glitches in the one checkbox wrong in the way that the text is formatted, one little thing that just doesn't quite work and the whole thing just fails. And you've got to be able to work out why it's not working and then do it. Because the belief outside is that you can quickly and easily do this thing. So there was an instant devaluation of what designers do as soon as a desktop computer was introduced to, to the way of doing it. And actually, I saw the writing on the wall, and one, one of the reasons I ended up emigrating from uh, England to Canada was because I got my first Macintosh computer. Well, it was actually a Macintosh 2CI. It had a massive 8 megabytes of RAM and a clock speed of 33 megahertz. Okay? Um, it didn't even have a hard drive. It had two floppy disks. Mm -hmm. One with the program on and one with the data. Okay? Um, but I put on a demonstration for our clients to show that we were, you know, up on the latest thing. So I had a kind of wine and cheese evening and we put on some demonstrations. And I overheard one saying to the other, Did you see how easy that was? And in that nanosecond I realized it was all over. <laughs> that we were done. Okay? And I don't think I was far wrong. What happened in those days, actually, was um, they started, they brought computers into their own in-house departments, and all of the bread and butter work that kept us going disappeared almost overnight. It was a very stressful period for me, because I, I was employing 12 people, and ended up with three in a matter of nine months. Okay? Now, what happened, fortunately, what they realized was um, that they weren't getting the results from the work they were doing for themselves that they had been from the professional work. And I do remember one client coming to me with the first document that they typeset using a desktop computer. And they had one of, that we'd done, in fact the last one that we'd done for them. And they had the two side by side. One, I would say, looked like silk, and the other one looked like burlap. And they wanted me to tell them what the difference was, and I said, no, I'm not telling you. If you want us to do the work, we'll do it. And actually, we did have to reduce our prices to get that work back. We did get it back, but at a much reduced uh, value. Okay? Um, and that happens uh, quite a lot. Now, um, some of the problems are in the way that software is developed and marketed. 
as I've said, they often portray it as being quick and easy. But anybody who's done it knows that it's not. Just ask one of my students from this morning's class. You know, it's very common. Mine's not doing it. Well, yours is identical to mine, and it worked when I did it. And then when I go, well, it works when I do it now. Well, that's what I did. Well, you can't have done, because if you had, it would have worked. Computers don't discriminate. <laughs> you know, they, it either works or it doesn't. So, there's one thing. A lot of people believe that when it goes wrong, it's not them. They, they believe it's the computer. <laughs> Uh, that's a big mistake. It's usually the bit between the chair and the keyboard that's causing the problems. Okay. Um, now, when design was an exclusive club and you had to be able to draw in order to get into that club, the thing that drawing equips you with is the ability to visualize. It's not about drawing, it's not about draftsmanship at all. It's about observation and then putting meaningful marks on a piece of paper that when other people see it, they can see what's in your mind's eye. And the computer creates an environment where you can kind of play with it. This happens a lot in my classes. Um, I'll go and say, what, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm just playing around. Well, if you're going to be commercially viable, there's no time for playing around. Yes, in the early stages, there's exploration of what these functions do, because you're always having to design within the limits of what the software will allow you. But actually, software is so sophisticated now that basically you can produce anything that your imagination can devise. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people sit down at computers and work very inefficiently because they don't have a plan. There is no visualization. Um, and I think that's one of the key problems here, is this, it's the lack of a plan and the lack of the ability to visualize. So it's not about drawing, it's about observation and having an index card of visual experiences. Um, the other thing is the software comes with, and it's, it's basically two sides to it. Okay? What they're trying to do, do it very well is convince you that if you buy this software, life's going to be easier for you. It's going to automate things. And in fact, that was the promise I was given when I bought my first computer. I remember the salesman telling me this. Because I was I was dubious, I must say, I was looking at what was coming off these machines and going, I don't think anybody's going to buy that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the quality. And things haven't improved very much because programs come with default settings that are predefined. They come with automatic features that are predefined that make it appear to be easy to do things. Um, but unfortunately, these default settings give things a look. I can spot it from across the room. It's a default. And there's nothing creative about that. And if there's no creative input, then it has a very low perceived value. Because the person on the outside, the sponsor, the person who's going to pay for this, believes that it's easy to do. And now there are a few really good examples of this that I noticed very, very quickly. Um, the first one was a gradient. A gradient is where one color blends into another one over a given space. If you wanted to do a gradient before the desktop computer, you had to be very nifty with a thing called an airbrush, which is mainly used in nails parlors these days, I think. You can have an airbrush nail. <laughs> There's loads of them later, I'll love them. Um, but we used to use those to create you know, a background for an ad or something. Now, you would have had to justify that based on the time and skill of the person you were paying to do it. It was not an easy thing to do. A gradient in every program now is three seconds and it's perfectly smooth, absolutely instant. So there's no value in that anymore, neither commercially nor creatively. Because you see them everywhere. <laughs> because it's a default. Okay? And that's, there's lots of things about that. Some are not so easy to notice, and I was talking about one this morning. 
one of my pet peeves is the default um, size of a frame that you put around a rectangle is one seventy second of an inch or one point wide. That is always too big. Okay? Because it's surrounding other things and it overwhelms them. It doesn't highlight them. It actually visually diminishes them. Up. Um, those sort of things create a look that you can spot very, very quickly. And there's no creativity, there's no perceived value. So all these are putting downward pressure on, on the work that designers do. Um, the other thing is typography. In, in communication, graphic communication, type plays a much more important part than pictures. Um, in fact, I've done more work that contain no pictures than I have work that contain no text. In fact, I don't even remember doing a job that had no text in it. We call that fine art, there's pictures you get on the wall. Okay? Even a poster that has a full bleed picture usually has some text, even if it's only a few words. Okay? Um, I think 85% of all printing in that year is used for uh, printing text, not pictures. Um, now, in the area of typography, computers have created this, well, let's try it and see. Um, and actually what happens with the software, when you choose a font and a size and a leading and a column width and all of those things that are the layout and the design, the computer writes the code to disk that will output that on a PostScript output device. Typesetting before desktop computers, it was done on a computer, but you had the text and then you had a highly skilled person coding it. And they were very highly paid. In fact, I had a typesetting business, as you said, and I was the owner of two businesses, but I paid my typesetter um, half as much, again, salary than I paid myself, because that was the value of that commodity. Disappeared almost overnight because now I don't need this person who can code it. I can play with it and then the computer will write the code for me. Okay? And unfortunately the default settings, this is another difference between the desktop computer and the typesetting computer, the defaults on the typesetting computer made it perfect. As long as you put the right code in, what it output was a good, good typesetting because it was designed specifically to do that. Um, desktop computers don't do that. The defaults are basically nothing at all. And you've got to go in and adjust those to get what you want. And in a lot of cases, people see typesetting as advanced word processing, but it's not. There are lots of things that you can do with type within programs like InDesign and uh, even Illustrator. Not Photoshop, that's a bit of an industry joke. Um, but it's not Microsoft Word. <laughs> okay? Um, so there's another devaluation of uh, what designers do because there are no typesetters anymore. Every designer is their own typesetter. And again, I can spot across the room the default settings because they're not very good. And that was when, when I first saw this, nobody's going to pay for that. The problem now is it's effectively free. Okay? Um, the typesetting comes free because you're not paying anybody to do it, you do it for yourself. So, you know, there are some of the uh, problems. Uh, now, as I said at the beginning, I, if computers were banned overnight, I would be one of the first people out in the street cheering. But unfortunately, that is not going to happen. In fact, and I've just been reading some material about this, technology is advancing exponentially. Programs will become more sophisticated more quickly than they have done already. Now, this whole visualization process that comes from the drawing, OK, 
okay, has been replaced to some extent by um, software gurus. And they're a totally different personality from what creative people used to be within a traditional studio. They tend to be introverted. I'll use the word nerdy. Because they're really into the, the functions of the program, but they can't visualize. Okay? But they've become kind of king of the hill because they're the person who knows which button to press to make this happen. I see it in my classes, okay? There's the go-to person that all the other people go to. They don't come to me necessarily because they feel more comfortable going to one of their fellow students. And they know, so they become the people who are regarded as having the, the power, okay? The knowledge. But, um, as technology advances, we might actually, well, I don't think it's might. I think we'll get to a point where those menu options and keyboard skills that are needed to be able to construct something um, are not required anymore. Imagine technology where all I have to do is put on a special hat and the computer can read my visual thoughts. Dangerous, I think, but anyway, it's certainly <laughs> possible. Okay? And then it can present that to me. And if I don't like it, it will adjust it. And there's already some of that actually buried in software, um, in InDesign. There's a thing that highlights the text where it thinks it doesn't look very good based on some parameters, and it highlights it in yellow and pink. And as you adjust it, the yellow and pink disappears. Okay? And then you've got the optimum that's available for that particular thing. So this is where the computer's kind of making visual decisions on your behalf. All you're doing is converting them. Okay? Um, then all these keyboard skills, knowledge of checkboxes and stuff will overnight disappear. Just like typesetting disappeared more or less overnight. Then, the people who have any earning power at all are the people who can visualize. The people who can see things in their mind's eye very well. And then that gets transferred on to the computer. Now, I see that as being a future. The way things are right now, and the way I see it, the only way that we can uh, benefit from this technology which has decimated the value of what creative people do, is to use it to its full effect. And this requires visualization too, because you need a plan. There are lots of um, automatic functions within software, and in fact I've just done this with the class of students this morning, where a third of them made no attempt to use the, the tool that did it efficiently. They did it all manually, piece by piece. Uh, the things I'm talking about in programs like InDesign, even uh, Illustrator, um, but Quark Express, um, the most powerful tool in the program is called Star Sheets. This is where you set a typographic style, and there are probably about a hundred different settings that you can build into this thing called a star sheet, and you um, make one key on, on the keyboard perform that style. And you can automate tons of this stuff, but what you can't do is make it up as you go along. The style has to be created before it's executed. Okay? Um, and there are some things where you can go back and edit the style after it's been applied and this again is globalized right across the whole document um, editable changes but mm, some things are cast in stone and you really can't change them without making massive effects the, the big thing with text that scares uh, printers is the word reflow this is where there's an adjustment in spacing within text and the um, computer adjust that and because the text flows through an entire document what can be a very minor thing at the beginning becomes a major problem on page 80 
we are looking at page 80 when this happens, you're looking at page 2, and you're doing what you think is a very minor change, but this thing cascades through the entire thing and renders things like style sheets absolutely useless. Okay? So you, have, you must have a plan. Um, the other aspect of this that I see where um, there's a devaluation is in uh, a, a degradation of standards, particularly in typography. Things that I would have been fired for by a client 25 years ago are commonplace now. Some of them are just niceties. They're typographic etiquette. Okay? Um, one thing I see, for instance, it drives me crazy, is um, a drop capital letter on multiple paragraphs in the story. The convention is there should be one. The first paragraph in the story. Uh, I even see it in the three newspapers that you can get. The indented first paragraph of the story. That would have been unforgivable 25 years ago, but they just don't know any better, and it's free. It's a free newspaper. Okay? <laughs> so nobody's going to complain because it's free. I got it free, so why? why? There's no value in it. Okay? It's kind of scary. That's just one example. So the other thing that I think we've got to hang on to, like drowning men hang on to life rafts, is uh, quality, standards of imagery and particularly typography. Without those things, those two things, the efficiencies that software gives us, a plan, visualization, and quality, I think the whole design business could become less than a minimum wage job. Actually, I have a friend who works for a large publishing company that I'll remain nameless, but they outsource all of their document construction uh, to India, where the computer operators get $3 an hour. And they really don't mind if it's done inefficiently, because they're only paying $3 an hour. Whereas somebody here couldn't function on $3 an hour, so we, the only option we've got is to work more efficiently. Um, and it, I could give you examples of where it's a factor of 10. I can do it this way, same design, or I can do it this way, and I can do it 10 times more efficiently. Because not only is it faster, it's more accurate, it's consistent. Um, unfortunately, uh, people like to play around, it's sort of like this illusion that the computer gives you this environment where things are endlessly changeable. Uh, I can play around until I get something nice. Actually, Bob Newhart, Years ago, when I was a kid, used to do these monologues. And uh, you only ever heard one half of the conversation. And that's what made it funny. But anyway, he was testing out the theory that if you give enough monkeys and typewriters and long enough, then one of them will quite by accident write a Shakespeare's sonnet. And he's reporting back on progress. And he says, I think I found one. Hang on a minute, I'll read it to you. And he reads it out. And it's to be or not to be. That is the schmuffnum. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got close, but not quite. So that's the wrong way of approaching it. That's not a benefit as far as I can see. It's a, that's one of the things that's causing devaluation. Now, if I play around with it for long enough, I'll end up with something that looks okay eventually. Um, if you're going to be efficient, that absolutely uh, doesn't work at all. Now, um, the other thing I think as well that I see a lot of is um, graphic design, commercial art, if that's what it was called when I started, is much more objective than it is subjective. This was why when uh, typeset virtually disappeared overnight and cl my clients started doing it for themselves, they didn't get the results that the quality work did. Uh, unfortunately, they realized it. Okay. Um, but as software gets more and more widespread and more and more people are using it, um, people become less objective and much more subjective. In fact, I had a student this morning who was, we were having a discussion about a mark. 
Um, and he said, well, I, I think my mark should be higher because I thought my design was better than you do. Well, that's subjective. <laughs> <laughs> and my argument is objective. It didn't fit the criteria. It was supposed to be in color and you did it in black. Yeah, but I thought black was nice. That subjective argument doesn't work. It's, it's an objective uh, argument. And I think what happens because of the technology and the ability to play around with things, people are interacting with what they create subjectively rather than objectively. And that further devalues what we do because you don't get the results from stuff that's purely subjective. If fine art's purely subjective, I do paintings, I do them to please me. And I'm not really too bothered whether people like them or not, it's nice if they do. But I do them purely for my own benefit. Um, whereas the commercial work, there has to be an object. I think also the education system fails in some ways. Um, I know what I was told that art was, you know, a waste of time. That wasn't a job; it was a hobby. So we tend to put way too much importance on. Uh, academic skills rather than creative problem solving. Um, and uh, if software and technology is changing exponentially as, as, as it is, um, I think our only option is to be creative, to be able to address change. I know when I had to come to the decision to uh, leave England and come to Canada, it was a very difficult thing, but I could see the change coming. Uh, it was once described as like a steamroller. Technology is like a steamroller. You either get on the steamroller or become part of the road. I remember hearing that. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's it. I'm out of here. Okay? Um, and I think it's pretty much come as where I said. On the uh, issue of education, I'd just like to uh, mention a couple of books that I found very inspiring. Sir Ken Robinson, very interesting. He grew up in Liverpool, I grew up in Hull. He's the same age as me, okay? Uh, he's now an international speaker and does a couple of very interesting TED Talks on uh, art education. Basically, he's an advisor to world governments now on arts education. Okay, so he's done a lot better than me, but um, I haven't got my data quite yet. But uh, his two books, The Element, which talks about um, how creativity, um, if you're passionate about what you do, then you will enjoy doing it, and therefore be probably a lot better at it. And then uh, a sequel to that, which is called Out of Our Minds, which talks about the importance of creativity, not just in the arts uh, fields, but in business in general, because of the way technology is changing and affecting the jobs that we do. So, uh, yeah, I found those two books very inspiring. So, as a continuation of what I've been talking about, I would recommend those highly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.